Good evening and suki hotu to all brothers and sisters in the Dharma and to all our viewers who are tuning in to our Dharma sharing session tonight. Tonight's session on the Breaking Myths Dharma Sharing Series by Dr. Punya Wong is entitled Breaking Myths Number 7, Buddhist and Grace Before Food. If you have missed any of the previous Breaking Myths sessions by Dr. Punya, you're still able to watch the recordings on the Facebook page. Right, so let me now introduce our very own distinguished Dharma speaker for tonight, Dr. Punya Wong. He's currently an Associate Professor in Internal Medicine at Monash University, Malaysia, based in Johor Bahru. He's an established Dharma speaker who has been regularly sharing Dharma in Malaysia, Singapore, Jakarta, Manila, Ho Chi Minh City, and Bangkok for the last two decades. Had also been invited to speak at the third, seventh, and eighth global conference on Buddhism. And due to the recent COVID-19 pandemic, in this era of new norm, Dr. Wong's focus is now shifted to sharing Dharma online via Zoom, Facebook, and even WhatsApp. And Dr. Wong has just recently published a Dharma book called Breaking Myths, comprising a collection of sharings on the theme of breaking myths in Buddhism. And this book was officially launched virtually on 18 of October this, um, 2020, this year, which was broadcasted across Malaysia, Singapore, and Indonesia. Right? So without further ado, I shall now hand over to Dr. Punya Wong for his Dharma sharing tonight. Welcome, Dr. Punya. Sad, sad, sad. Namo Buddhaya, brothers and sisters in the Dhamma. Thank you again for inviting me to share tonight. And I'm very happy that tonight the good folks in Suramban at Sudama have also joined in our family of cross-sharing across Facebook Live. Welcome. Today we are going to share with regards to myths about Buddhism and food. And a very often held myth is that Buddhists do not say grace or thank you before food. This is actually far from the truth. It is actually a practice that is highly encouraged, but sadly, many lay people do not do it at home and especially in public places. This is actually our fault. In both the Theravada and Mahayana traditions, the Sangha will do reflections and give blessings before eating their food. The big difference from Tahistic religions is that instead of asking for some divine being to bless the food. The practice here is we are the ones giving thanks to all who had contributed to the meal, from the farmer to the vegetables and the animals, to the delivery man, the cook and the donor, all inclusive. We, the consumer, the final consumer, gives the blessings or aspirations to these same beings. Instead of invoking some divine deity, it is the person who is going to consume the food that actually gives their blessings, offer their gratitude and make aspirations. That is the huge difference. In the Theravada tradition, the gatha below is very commonly used. And I'm happy to hear some lay people now saying this, chanting this brief line before their meals. Some of you may recognize that this is the first verse given by the Venerable Sangha in their blessings. And I'm sure when you hear this, it is familiar to you. 
Sabitio viva jantu, Sabarogo vina satu, Mate bawa tuan tarayu, Suki dika yuko bawa. This is actually a blessing or an aspiration which the person gives to all the people in that chain that had led to that meal in front of him. Mate means you are giving it to another person. If you wish to say the same aspiration for yourself, then it will be mahme, M-E. It means, may all distresses be averted, may every disease be destroyed, may there be no dangers for you, may you be happy and live long. Wonderful aspirations for all who had worked or sacrificed to give us the meal on our table. You may also realize that this gata that is often used is actually the first and the very last part of the blessings given by the Sangha. The Sangha will usually end with the Bawantu Sabha Mangalam. And for those of us who are offering food, when you hear the Bawantu Sabha Mangalam, Prakantu Sabha Dewata, Sabha Budanu Bhavena, Sada Soti Bawantu Te, may all blessings be mine, may all deities protect me, by the protective powers of the Buddha, may I ever be safe. Then you know that the Sangha is going to eat their meals and soon you will have yours too. So if you wish to do it the short way, you can do the Sapitiyo Viva Jantu. But if you feel that you would like to do these whole four verses, then that is perfectly fine and very good. It is short, it is easily remembered, and it's a very, very pleasant, powerful blessing. A contemplation for the wise use of food is also commonly practiced in many centers. And it is often written as wisely reflecting, I use this food not for fun, not for pleasure, not for fattening, not for beautification, but only for the maintenance and nourishment of this body, for keeping, keeping it healthy, for helping me with the spiritual life. Thinking thus, I will allay hunger without overeating, so that I may continue to live blamelessly and at ease. I've also seen this, and this is equally good, this reflection, this food I take, properly considering it, not playfully, not for intoxication, not for fattening, not for beautifying, but only for the continuation and nourishment of this body, for keeping it unharmed, for helping it to live a pure life, thinking I shall destroy hunger. Thus will I be free from bodily troubles and live at ease. Also wonderful, constantly reminding us that we are activities that needs fuel. Without that fuel, without the sacrifice from other species, we cannot continue and we have to be grateful to them. A longer reflection before eating is shown in this extract that I took. The message remains the same, but here in the second verse it adds that this food I am about to eat comes to me through the work and care of many beings. Therefore, I will eat it with gratitude. While I have sufficient to eat, there are many beings who do not share these blessings. Therefore, I will take only what I need and eat everything I take. Some eat for entertainment and for fun. I will eat only to allay hunger, to maintain the body, so that I can live the holy life in comfort and in good health. Recall these are from the Theravada tradition. A simple card printed and laminated out, I have seen placed on the table, and then this 
is a useful, simple way for us to do a very short chant and remind ourselves, not just for eating this food in a moderate manner, but also for the fact that it comes to us at a high price. The lives of veggies and animals and the hard work of many people. You will realize that none of us can exist without food. Now, in the Mahayana tradition, they too have similar aspirations and expressions of gratitude. When I was at Fo Kuang San headquarters at Kaohsiung at a retreat, we were taught the following aspirations. Those of you who know it can read it in Chinese, but I've taken the liberty to translate it. The aspirations being that loving kindness, compassion, joy, and equanimity permeate the worlds. You will recognize this as the four Brahma Viharas. To treasure opportunities to cultivate friendship and benefit heaven and earth. To practice meditation and stillness, cultivate morals and tolerance. With repentance and gratitude, let us make great aspirations. In Pinyin, very poetic, easy to remember, and profound message. Now, those of you who had been to Mahayana centers would remember or recall that the dining hall is called the Hall of Five Contemplations, Wu Guan Tang. And every meal, one is to reflect on these five contemplations before you eat, as you eat, and after you eat. It is usually written and framed out in the walls, on the walls of the dining hall. And the five mealtime contemplations include consider the work that went into the food and where it came from. Reflect on my virtues and conduct and if my virtues and conduct merit this offering. Guard the mind against faults, greed in particular. Regard it as wholesome medicine for healing the weakened body. For the sake of attaining the way, I shall receive this food. You will recognize that the spirit of these words is almost the same in both the traditions. In detail, 72 labors have brought us this food. We should know, contemplate where it comes from. Second, as we receive this offering, we should consider whether our virtue and practice deserve it. Third, as we desire the mind to be free from clinging, we must be free from greed. Fourth, to support our life, we receive this food. Fifth, to realize the way, we accept this food. So you eat with gratitude, knowing where it comes from. We eat with gratitude and humility, whether we actually deserve it eat in moderation because we know that if we don't eat we will die we need it to support our lives and we need this life to walk the path to realize the truths the five contemplations these that you see in pink is very often the one which is framed up on the walls These five simple sentences have lasted for centuries because of the depth of its meaning, its compassion, and its wisdom. It reminds us to be fully present in the moment and not eat for fun or eat unmindfully. It reminds us to be as green as possible and our purpose on earth. It reminds us of our practice and it reminds us 
to control our greed, our anger, and our delusions. Five contemplations while eating is an exercise that forces the Buddhists to stop and think about the food that they are eating. What food is, why we eat it, where it comes from, and when and how we should eat it. This is important. Sometimes there are, in many centers, additional lines added to make it even more forceful, and this include the first morsel is to cut all delusions. The second morsel that you bite on is to maintain your clear mind. The third morsel is to save all sentient beings. And the fourth one, may you awaken together with all beings. I read this out, a short little composition by Venerable Yifa. When we sit down to eat in our monastery, we try to be conscious of several things. We eat in silence because this way you can concentrate on the food and practice awareness or mindfulness. Then you eat everything on the plate. This is our way of honoring the conservation of resources. Modern English, be green, leave as little carbon footprint as possible. We try to make sure the conservation of resources takes place before the food even reaches our plate, the portions we receive aren't too big, and this way it isn't difficult to eat all that is given. We remember the preparation of the food, or the workers, or the veggies, etc. And we don't choose what we eat. That is a monastic life. We are not in a monastery to become gourmet. We are there because we need to cultivate appreciation and non-attachments to all things, and this includes food. The Venerable Thich Nhat Hanh had modified it slightly for his center's usage, but the essence, the message, remains the same. Now, those of you who are familiar with Japanese culture would know that almost all Japanese families will say itadakimas before they eat their meals. It is an essential phrase. And the word itadakimas is often translated as I humbly receive. Thank you for the food. And its simplest translation will be to receive, to get, to accept, to take humbly this food that you had placed in front of me. This explains why one says it before one's eat. We are receiving food. And this expression, itadakimas, comes from the Japanese people's roots in Buddhism, which teaches respect and gratitude for all living beings. This thinking extends to meal times in the form of thanks to the plants, the animals, farmers, parents, chefs, and everything that went into the making of the meal. It is very simple. When the food has been placed on the table, and before one eats, one puts the hand together in Anjali, in the lotus posture, and bow the head slightly and say, Itadakimas, and then pick up the chopsticks and start eating. This is a good practice that cannot be made any simpler. I was at a Zen monastery once with good brothers and sisters from Malaysia and Singapore. And here, it is a Japanese Zen monastery. The very same five lines that are used in contemplation are used here. It's words in Chinese is exactly the same. And the meal is eaten in silence. You are supposed to leave behind one piece of pickle, 
And at the end of the meal, put hot water into each bowl, take the pickle, wipe it around so that everything goes into the water, pour it into this bigger one and drink it so that nothing goes to waste. Mindful eating is something that is very useful. Eat all meals at a designated place, such as the dining table, while sitting down and relaxing. I know it is difficult. I don't deny it. But let us try to avoid distractions. Try not to watch TV or multitask while we have our meals. Take deep breaths and avoid judgment of ourselves and our reaction to the food and we eat. Take small bites instead of huge gulps and chew slowly and thoroughly. As we eat, frequently mind the mind. Look at the mind. See the mind saying, oh, you can pose a cat. Oh, that one very good. Oh, you got, oh, I like that one. Notice all these thoughts. And of course, notice the sensations in our funk, in our body, in our abdomen. It is basically mindfulness meditation. All of our senses will be utilized while eating. Of course, this eating of this meal will be rather slow, but you can enjoy it. Candlelight dinners are not only for paktor, candlelight dinners are also for mindful eating. Now, inevitably, when I share on food and Buddhism, the question of vegetarianism comes up, inevitably. In the Chinese Mahayana practice, as you all know, Chinese Mahayana practice is very much vegetarian. But if you look at Mahayana practices in other countries, for example, in Korea, Japan, Tibet, you will realize that it is not necessarily so. So if we look at it, Historically, you will realize that one of the reasons why Chinese Mahayana practice is very much vegetarian is because of the very powerful influence by one emperor called Liang Hu Ti. Liang Hu Ti lived in the 6th century, 500 plus common era. And he was a very eminent practicing Buddhist emperor. 500 plus is after Kumara Jiva, during the time of Bodhidharma and before Xuanzang. So in 511 CE, he wrote that the Buddhist Sangha should exclusively adopt a diet that cuts wine and meat consumption entirely. And this instruction marks the Chinese Buddhist Mahayana Sangha abandonment of meat eating. And he presided over two Buddhist councils in China regarding this matter and issued a total of five edicts which sealed this practice within the Chinese Mahayana Sangha. Hence, in Chinese Mahayana practice, vegetarianism became the accepted norm. This is the same emperor, Liang Wuti, who famously met Bodhidharma and asked Bodhidharma three questions. That will be a topic that I will discuss another time. But the Vinaya discipline does not specifically outlaw meat eating. It records in the Chinese Vinaya that there is no specific prescription against eating meat while practicing the Dharma, nor is there any requirement to repent after eating meat while following the Dhamma. So this was a practice they chose to impose on themselves. But vegetarianism 
within Chinese Mahayana practice became established and entered common consciousness. So much so that the instant one talks of Chinese Mahayana Buddhism and meals, we are almost inevitably referring to vegetarian meals, and he has entered common consciousness into expressions such as this, sen duo zhou sao, meaning a lot of sangha, a lot of monks, but very little porridge, when there is inadequate distribution. There are three vinayas, an extent today that is utilized. The Tarawada, the Mula Sawastidin, which is the Tibetan school's Vinaya, and the Dharma Guptadin, which is East Asian. But they are the same in substance, and they have only very minor differences. The number of rules differs slightly, but the essence of the Vinaya remains the same. Now, the Mahayana Vinaya goes on to even state that they are not to reject the traditional rules of the traditional schools. And if anyone thinks that a future Buddha has nothing to do with learning or observing the law of the vehicle of the Sravakas, Sravakas means the listeners, the Theravadins, he commits a sin of pollution. They have to follow. The big difference, however, is within the Theravada schools of practice, the venerables go for arms round, and hence they have to accept what is given, what is offered. This versus the Chinese Mahayana Sangha, who have to grow their own food. Arms round is only ceremonial. They basically have to grow their own food. Now, the Emperor Liang Wuti gave lots of land for monasteries, and these were huge lands on which not only buildings were constructed, but also farmlands to grow food. He also gave ordination to lots of people. You need consent in those days. And of course, he gave lots of financial assistance. Now, in the Jivaka Sutta of the Pali Canon, the Buddha instructs that a monk or a nun is to accept without any discrimination whatever arms food is offered with goodwill, including meat. Hence, a monk on arms round will have to accept with gratitude whatever the householder offers him. So, the Theravada Buddhist monks are not to be selective <clears throat> or to display preferences towards arms. This would illustrate attachment, aversion, delusion. Insisting on a vegetarian diet implies aversion to meat, attachment to ideology, and perhaps even a sense of superiority in one's diet. Furthermore, to deny a lay person's alms offering would deprive them of the karmic fruits for giving to the Sangha. Based on this, the monks, as advised in the Jivaka Sutta, should accept all that is offered to them. So collecting food versus cultivating food gave rise to much differences. First is, of course, the principle of not killing the very first precept. And for the Chinese Mahayana Sangha, who were to cultivate their own food, the principle of non-killing becomes very, very applied in their dietary ways, because how are they to raise animals in a monastery and slaughter them for food? That will be completely against the precept. So the logical thing is that for them in the monastery, they will have to just grow vegetables and use vegetarian food because raising and slaughtering animals for meat will not only be against the Sangha, but against the very principle of not killing. So you wrote that it is in the mind state. 
coupled with the principle of loving kindness, compassion, metakaruna, and self-cultivation, it will be not acceptable for them. The indirect killing as a result of market demands today and the huge animal husbandry industrial complex may or not be may or may not be acceptable to some cultivators. That will be an individual choice. The Buddha in Majima Nikaya, in his advice to Jivaka, his physician, he said, in three cases, I say that meat may not be eaten. If it is seen, heard, or suspected that that meat, that animal, is intentionally killed for the Sangha. In which case, it would be considered an impure meat. In three cases, I say that meat may be eaten. It is not seen, not heard, or even suspected that that animal was slaughtered intentionally for the Sangha. Then that meat is considered as pure. San Ting Ro in Chinese. However, we have to realize this applies to arms rounds. This passage is interpreted as allowing the consumption of meat for the Sangha if that animal is not specifically slaughtered for the monastic who is going around collecting arms food. Now, Jivaka, the Buddha said, and this is an important passage which lots of people do not read after offering that first part on the three pure meats. The Buddha said, anyone who slaughters a living animal specifically for the enlightened one or the Sangha makes much bad karma for five reasons. When they say, go fetch that living creature, this is the first reason. It is a bad effect on the mind because you're going to kill that creature. When that living creature experiences pain, sadness, stress, being dragged to the slaughterhouse, that is the second reason. And of course, the intention of killing that living animal. And then when the living creature experiences pain and sadness, that's the fourth. And when they provide the enlightened one or the disciples, the Sangha, with this unallowable food, that is the fifth. So if you understand this part of the Jivaka Sutta, you will realize very clearly that if you are to kill that animal specifically, then that would not be desirable. That would create a bad mind state in your mind, in the person's receiving its mind. So this most, this practice, of course, is for the Sangha when we are offering food. However, the most clear reference to monastic consumption of non-vegetarian food is also found in the Pali Canon, where the Buddha explicitly refused the proposal by Devadatta to make vegetarianism compulsory. So then the Buddha refused to make vegetarianism compulsory. We know that the Sangha right from the early days ate meat. Devadatta requested five austerities, five austere practices. One, the Sangha had to stay in the forest for their entire life, which means it cannot stay in Subhanjaya Buddhist Association. He has to live somewhere at the foothills of Fraser's Hill in the forest. Sangha should not accept the invitation to meal, but had to completely rely on begging for food. Means you cannot ask for a house dana or offer at the center. He has to go on arms round every day. Sangha should wear only ropes from discarded racks. You're not allowed to accept ropes, not even what you are offering at Katina. Sangha should dwell under the trees only and not under the roof, which means no temple dwelling. Sangha should abstain completely from fish and meat, strictly vegetarian. Now, Devadatta wanted these five austerities or five austere practices, but the Buddha declined. 
He refused to make it a Vinaya rule. The Buddha's reply was that those who so wish to follow these rules on their own inclination, except for that of sleeping under a tree, because during the rainy season, that is simply not practical. The Buddha said, if you so wish to follow these, then it is your individual decision, your individual choice. But the Buddha refused to make these rules obligatory in the Vinaya, because these rules were too radical and did not reflect the principle of the middle way. Remember, the very foundation of our cultivation is the middle way between two extremes. So the Buddha left it to the choice of the individual and how it affects his or her mind state. In another sutta, of course, this is well known to all of us. One of the traits in which a lay person should not engage in is dealing with this industry of supplying meat because it inevitably will involve killing. However, there is, of course, still many contradictions to my mind. I have to say it, for seven years I was a vegetarian. But I found this that I showed in front of you a contradiction. Because within our local vegetarian community, very often we go to a vegetarian restaurant and ask for fish, for pork, for chicken, for drumstick, etc., etc., etc. To me, this is a contradiction in terms. Do I still have craving for all of this? Let me show you an interesting video so that I can have a break and drink some water at the same time. Uh, Dr. Puna? Yes. Uh, you, you have to share screen, Dr. Puna? Sorry? Dr. Puna, you have to share, share screen. Oh, have I not shared screen? Yeah. Hang on. Sorry, just give me a minute. The thing has disappeared. My apologies. Someone at Subhan Jai is so efficient because I keep seeing the the changing of the slides that I thought I had shared screen. My apologies. I will start this again. Yes. So as I was saying, when I see this, I inevitably can't help but think of that video. 
because like that girl who should be really thinking of helping the husband at the very last moment the lady thought of her own beauty so when i see this is there a contradiction in terms that when people are wanting vegetarian food and yet ask for this and say wow it really tastes like chicken or it really tastes like fish or wow you know really tastes like salmon i personally found that a huge contradiction in terms. But for the lay Buddhists, for the lay Buddhists, which is the majority of us, following the advice given by the Buddha, the guidelines given by the Buddha to the Sangha, when we adapt it to us, the first point is, of course, to try our best not to be involved in any direct killing. Involvement in a direct killing would be something not appropriate. So you may consume meat or other animal products as long as that animal product was not specifically slaughtered for you. So going to a restaurant and say, why do you like this one I want, this one I want, will not be very appropriate. But going to a hypermarket like what you see here and just buying a filet will probably be much less traumatic on our mind state. Now, our basis is not to create suffering, not to create pain to other creatures. So the first precept that we all are familiar with, Hanati Pata Veramani Sika Padam Samadhi Yami. And this first precept, we often translate it as not to kill. But if you are someone who is very obsessive about the exact terminology, first is not just not to kill, but not to harm. And second, the word panatipata has a strong root in the word breathing, apana. This is the air that moves in and out of our body. This is respiration. Life is associated with respiration. And one of the Pali words for animal life is apana, literally breeding things. And so the first precept actually says, I take the precept not to harm breeding things. That's why it's panati pata. Now, for those of you who are in science, even it's sixth form physics or pre-U biology or pre-U biomedicines, you will realize that Almost everything, including vegetables, have respiration. And we talk of even aerobic and anaerobic metabolism in microbes. So, strictly speaking, all forms of life, including vegetables, have respiration. So we can only minimize pain and suffering. We can only minimize killing. We cannot be 100% abstaining from it, or we will not be able to live. How it affects our mind is, of course, still the most important thing. If we look at the Ahsoka rock edicts, it actually mentions the prohibition of animal sacrifices and his commitment to vegetarianism. Now, Ahsoka lived 200 years after the Buddha's Parinibbana. So when we have Ahsoka's personal commitment made just 200 years after the Buddha's Parinibbana, it suggests to us very strongly that early Buddhism for the lay people already had a long vegetarian tradition. Now, this is an interesting sutta in the Sutta Nipata of the Kuddaka Nikaya. There, it is not our present Buddha, but a Buddha of the past that is recorded to have a conversation with a vegetarian Brahmin. Now, the Brahmin here insisted that his status is higher and more well-deserved due to his observance of a vegetarian diet. Kashapa Buddha countered the argument by listing acts which cause real moral defilements and stating the mere consumption of meat is not equivalent to those acts. In simple words, there are far worse things to deal with. Let's take a look at this sutta. The 
But Buddha Kashapa said, taking life, beating, wounding, binding, stealing, lying, deceiving, worthless knowledge, adultery, this is stench, this is foul smelling, not the eating of meat. In a world, those individuals who are unrestrained in sensual pleasures, who are greedy for sweet things, who are associated with impure actions, who are of nihilistic views which are crooked and difficult to follow, this is stench, not the eating of meat. In this world, those who are rude, arrogant, backbiting, treacherous, unkind, excessively egoistic, miserly, and do not give anything to anybody, this is stench, not the eating of meat. So you will see in this text that there are actually far worse things than what we put in our mouth. Even things that come out of our mouth is actually far worse than what we put into our mouths. I think this is a very important teaching that we have to realize. How many of us here are aware that Hitler is a vegetarian or was a vegetarian? All right. So why do we eat? Can we not kill at all? Well, the Venerable Ananda is very clear that ultimately we do not want to have to live by consuming other species and life forms. But the reality of life is that as long as we are living in samsara, we are going to survive by consuming other species and life forms. But until we reach enlightenment and no longer are reborn with a need for food, we have no choice. So we need to eat mindfully with constant reflection of its purpose. Let us take a look at this sutta which is said by the Venerable Ananda, taught by the Venerable Ananda to Anand. And he said, this body sister comes into being through food. And yet it is by relying on food that food is to be abandoned. Thus was it said. In what reference to what was it said? That means this body, we need it. And we can only sustain this body with food. And it is only by relying on this food that we eat that hopefully one day we do not need to eat food anymore. We do not need to kill. We do not need to eat other species. There is the case, sister, where a monk, considering it thoughtfully, takes food, not playfully, not for intoxication, nor for putting on bulk, nor for beautification. You realize these lines are the same lines we use in our food reflection but simply for the survival and continuance of this body, for ending its afflictions and for the support of the holy life. Thus will I destroy all feelings of hunger and not create new feelings from overeating. I will maintain myself, be blameless and live in comfort. Then he, went, then he eventually abandons food, having relied on food. That is, when he becomes a lightened, with Paranibbana, Parinibbana, he has no more new body. He does not need food anymore. So this body sister comes into being through food. And yet it is by relying on food that food is to be abandoned. So we need to eat, be it veggie, be it meat, to survive. But our aim is not to harm all beings, all beings that breathe. From the biological viewpoint, everything. We aim not to kill, not to create or inflict pain. And that can only happen if we do not have a physical body. But we need this physical body to cultivate, to be enlightened. So until that day, we need food. So that is why you will see in the reflections that I had shared earlier, it all speaks of this principle. Now, do plants feel? Now, now the present thinking is that although plants do not have the nervous system that we have, they can still sense trauma being eaten, being cut, and they let out chemical distress calls. For example, we all love the smell of a newly cut lawn, 
Are we aware, are you aware that that smell is actually a cry by the plant that it is being hurt? It is to warn themselves that there is danger. There is also evidence that plants can hear themselves being eaten. They actually respond to caterpillars biting them, etc., etc. A final solution is that we have to be enlightened. We have to have no physical body. The existential fact is that humans will live at the expense and harm to other species. And the Buddha's final solution to this is the only way in which this problem could be satisfactorily resolved. And that is to chart a cause to get out of samsaric existence, namely a chart to Nibbana. Now, as Buddhists, what is our conclusion now? One, we should not be too obsessive about whether to eat vegetables or meat. But whatever it is to eat in moderation, the middle way, and be mindful of the three conditions that the Buddha taught the monks. We will apply that same three guidelines. We know now that even eating veggies alone does not mean that killing is avoided. Because to plant the veggies, farmlands alone being cleared will cause many creatures to die. We alter the entire ecology. And furthermore, your beautiful veggies come because of insecticides. But if your mind feels more comfortable and peaceful to be vegetarian, then by all means you should be vegetarian. But if you feel okay at ease to be a flexitarian, then please do not create prisons which are conceptual. The main guiding principle is to be as kind as possible, not to cause harm, not to cause pain. And above all, be thankful for what we have to eat. Give a blessing to all before we eat. Now, at the age of 14, this venerable, who became subsequently the fourth patriarch, came to the third patriarch and said, I beg you, Master, to show your compassion and lead me to the Dhamma gate, Farman, the way of liberation. And the third patriarch asked him, Who has bound you? Who has tied you up? Who has stopped you? And Tao Zin replied, Nobody has bound me. He then the third patriarch said, If so, why should you seek for liberation from being bound where nobody has bound you? I hope you understand this teaching here. A lot of our prisons are created by us. We tie ourselves down with divine and human bondages. The Arahan is freed from all divine and human bondages. And a lot of such bondages are conceptual. So coming back to this question, let us not be too obsessive. Follow the principle of not to kill, which means when we go to a restaurant, do not pick up something living, swimming, moving, and say, I want that one. Eat in moderation. Eat what has already been killed in a hypermarket. Be mindful of the three conditions. You have seen it, you heard it, or you suspect it, and you avoid it. And we remember that even when you boil water, you kill. Does it mean that from now on, my moderator, Sister Li Ming, is going to stop boiling water? Obviously, she will still continue boiling water. Does it mean that all the doctors in this audience will stop treating with antibiotics? Because you're going to kill millions and millions and millions of bacteria, which have either aerobic or anaerobic metabolism. They too breathe. And does it mean that we are going to stop deworming an orang asli child or a child with worm infestation? No. We have to remember the reason why we are doing it. It is for a higher good. And hence, if you realize that, if I were to go back now to the reasons and what we say before we eat, you will realize that we eat 
because we are trying to achieve a higher good. Consider the food that went, the work that went into the food and where it came from. It comes from many, many things that had to be sacrificed for us to live. Cooking vegetarian food, you kill many things. Cultivating vegetables, you kill many things. You alter entire ecologies, we kill many, many things. Our human lives are at the expense of other species. So when you realize that, do we deserve all that has been sacrificed for us? Whether vegetarian, flexitarian, meat rian, these other species have to die. So if we are worthy of that food, then our virtues and conduct must be good. Let us eat in moderation. Let us regard food as medicine. As I said, without food, we cannot survive. For the sake of attaining the way, I shall receive this food. So as Buddhists, we eat this food just like the Venerable Ananda said, so that one day we will not need to eat this food. So that one day we do not need others to die for us to live. Brothers and sisters, I'm going to close by showing you my last slide. This is my last slide. We eat, yes, so that we can act. We eat, yes, so that we can live. If you walk into any Japanese temple, Buddhist temple, you will see these two animals at the entrance. This is the Buddhist center. This is the entrance. On one side, this animal. On this side, this animal. Very often, well, we just walk and take it for granted. But here lies a very profound message. This animal here on the right is a mythical lion with an open mouth. This is when we are born. We wail, we cry, we are going to eat a lot for the rest of our earthly life. The animal on this side has the mouth which is closed. This represents this animal which has died. Its mouth is closed, while the others around him have open mouths wailing in sadness. This is the distance between the two animals. This is the entrance to the animal, sorry, to the temple. From the time you are born to the time you die, with an open mouth, wailing, eating, to a closed mouth. What we are going to do in this space, in this time, is entirely up to us. These two animals is a constant reminder of the ephemeral nature of our lives, of whether we are doing our purpose, and the fact that so much had to be sacrificed for us. As you walk in, this is the temple, the center for you to cultivate. Are we using this time well, or are we wasting this time? Brothers and sisters, I thank you for your attention. I apologize that right at the start, I was not even aware that I wasn't sharing because the brother said Subang Jaya was so efficient and I saw the slides moving and I thought I was actually moving it. So thank you so much. I hope what I have shared had helped you. I'll try to answer whatever questions that are available. Thank you. Right. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Sadu, sadu, sadu. Right. Thank you, Dr. Punya, for such a, an insightful um, Dharma sharing session tonight. Yeah, to let us know that we have to always reflect and also to contemplate on our food and as well as to give blessings and gratitude before each meal. Right. 
So in fact, this tonight's topic is um, indeed very relevant in today's society. Yeah, as many of us actually may not have said a prayer or grace, you know, at home when we eat or even eating in public, right? But that does not mean that, you know, we Buddhists don't practice it or that we are not grateful for our food, yeah? Which we now know that is a common myth, huh? So tonight, Dr. Punya have definitely widened our perspective, right? By opening up even more meaning and significance to this prayer that we do before our meals by doing mindful reflection, yeah, practicing moderation and humility, and also to offer gratitude and giving our blessings. Right, so there's so much more meaning to it now. Amazing. Right, okay, so um, now it's time for question and answer session, where we will take questions from our viewers to be answered by Dr. Punya. So um, if you have any questions, yeah, please put it, um, post them in the comment box now and we will take the questions, right? So I'll start the ball rolling, yeah? Dr. Punya, you, you see, um, for um, Sangha members, right, when they go for arms round, they, basically they cannot choose what food they eat, right? But for lay Buddhists, yeah, lay Buddhists, they, they, there are some people who are pretty much like a picky eater. So does this mean that um, they are not grateful enough for the food? Yeah, or you know, is it wrong for them to only choose to eat the food that they prefer and not the other things that they don't like? Right? <laughs> yeah. So, so what is the um, you know, uh, perspective <laughs> that we are looking at? Well, we are we are living in a very fortunate age now where we have so much choice of food. In an earlier era where people had not that much choice of food, your elders in the family will tell you that you'll be grateful for whatever food is on the table. And I'm sure your elders will have told you if you don't finish your food, your future spouse is going to have a lot of pimples on his or her face. So nowadays, of course, we have lots of choices. Now, as lay public, lay people, of course, you can enjoy your life. You can eat food that you want. In fact, that is one of the things that the Buddha said is the happiness of lay life. And lay people who have earned righteous wealth, yes, you can of course enjoy your food, eat the things that you like. But keep in mind the three pure meats, keep in mind moderation. Moderation, of course, is different from between a very rich person and a not so rich person. I mean, a very rich person can probably afford foods that a poor person can only dream of. But to him, that's also moderation. Now, having said that, nowadays we spoil our Sangha as well. I'm sure you will realize that the offerings in the center, the Sangha also pick and choose like any one of us at a buffet dinner. So that, of course, um, is due to us. We are offering them too much food. And well, with COVID-19, of course, that situation has changed slightly. You know, it used to be a huge buffet spread. But the point that all of us have to keep in mind is that yes, we are living in better times now. We have a choice of food and of course you can choose, but do it within the guidelines that we had discussed earlier. Moderation, try not to have such a huge carbon footprint, the three pure meats, and of course, doing our best not to harm, not to create pain in the process. Now, as far as the Sangha is concerned, during the arms round, they have to accept whatever is offered to them. And then they bring it back to the center where it is all put out again into a common sort of table or depending on the, the arrangement of that particular center. So even if a Sangha member says that I prefer to eat only vegetarian food, on receiving whatever food that is offered to him in the arms bowl and going back and putting it out, he also then can not, may not eat that food that he has received. But he receives it to give the lay person who is offering that opportunity to offer to the Sangha, that opportunity to do something wholesome, something good. That choice, the Buddha said, is individual. If it affects your mind state, then please do not eat meat. If you think that you can live with it, fine, go on to eat it. My cousin brother is a vet, and I've spoken to him. I've actually asked him, do fish feel pain? And he said they have no pain fibers like we have pain fibers 
you know, in the mouth area when people go fishing, etc., etc. So technically speaking, less pain is created compared to, for example, a big animal like a cow or a buffalo or something, which will obviously feel tremendous amounts of pain. But having said that, as I said, Hitler was a vegetarian. So it is not so much what you put in, but what you do, as the Buddha Kashapa said in the sutta that I showed you all, that is actually far more important, a bigger problem. Now, for all of us now living in Malaysia, we are spoiled for choice. So what that choice or what you wish to eat, well, Sister Li Ming says pickiness. Well, pickiness is a side effect of the luxury that we have today. If there is not much, then I doubt you'll be so picky. You'll be probably just grateful for whatever you have on the table. All right? Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for the explanation. It's very clear now. All right. So let's see what's um, the next question by our viewer, um, J. H. Go. Right. You, oh, okay. So the question is about, um, you see, for meat and fish, right, uh, you know, although Buddha said that, you know, as long as you don't slaughter it for the purpose of offering it to the Sangha members, but um, his question was like, how can the royalty actually offer meat or fish to an entire group of um, Sangha members uh, during Buddha's time? Especially if, you know, when it's for huge numbers, uh, you, you probably would know where the sauce comes from. Well, during the Buddhist time, you read of royalty, rich people making offerings to the Sangha. As to how big that Sangha is, I wouldn't be able to tell. What's the numbers, I would not be able to tell. But certainly you read of Ananda Pindika making offering, you read of Ananda Pika's brother making offering, you read of Bimbisara making offerings. And so how can they offer to such a huge group is unfortunately not a question that I can answer. But certainly there were records in the Pali Canon of big offerings to the Sangha and his followers. I mean, how big numerically they are, I will not be able to answer. Sometimes you know that in the text they are embellished into very huge numbers. But whether that is actually true or not, I do not know. But you even read of royalty making huge sacrifices. So if they can make huge sacrifices, I do not see why they are unable to feed a significant number of human beings. I don't I don't think that should be a problem. All right, Brother Cole. Now I read just now very quickly someone wrote about uh, Armstrong in China and I think that the person has misunderstood. Liang Wuti did not ban Armstrong. He wrote to the Sangha in China that he not only wrote, he actually passed imperial edicts that they are not to eat meat or fish. But they can go on arms round. They can very well go on arms round. There is a huge difference between the Indian culture and the Chinese culture. The Indian culture, even 2,600 years ago, and probably before, had a culture of people supporting people who wish to seek for the truth, who wish to seek higher levels of achievements spiritually. That is very much in the culture. So they were never seen as beggars. They were seen as people to whom I can make merits. That's why the bhikkhu does not beg. The bhikkhu gives us an opportunity to make merits. Now, the Chinese culture is slightly different. In the Chinese culture, people earn their own keep and they do not look at people coming around with a bow looking for food as something honorable. Hence, this practice of Armstrong in the Chinese culture became very much a ceremonial thing. Even within Mahayana traditions now, even within Zen temples in Japan, you have monks going on Armstrong, but it's more ceremonial than truly looking for food every day. So they were not prohibited by the Chinese emperor. They, they can go on Armstrong. What the Chinese emperor made edicts against was eating of meat and fish. So let us be very clear on that, okay? Right, thank you, thank you. That actually uh, answered the question from um, 
PGF, right? Um, by uh, brother Tim Apiao. Okay, so uh, we'll take the next question from um, Sister Sandra. Right, Sister Sandra. What would be the prayers or uh, phrase to offer thanks uh, before we eat? Something that is easy, short, and practical. I think, um, Brother Punya, you have actually mentioned in the in the yeah. talk just now. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And, and also, sorry, um, there's also which is something that uh, also from Doctor Wu. Yeah, Doctor Wu from Saramban Sudama. Yeah. yeah, he asked the same question as well. Um, there are so many food reflections. Which one should we follow? Right. So I think right. this, both these questions are pretty similar mm. for you to yeah answer. Yeah. Yeah, I I think this is something which would very much be dependent on your circle of friends. Um, when I discuss this with my own little group in JB, um, one particular brother say, "Ayo, I cannot remember like, This one so long like, da, 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 da. So then I say, okay, if it is so long, then we'll, we'll do the itadakimas, which is just one word. And itadakimas is what my wife and I does before we eat. So that's only one word. And um, it's become so much a practice that sometimes when I forget, my wife scolds me. So uh, itadakimas, as you know, is the Japanese way of doing it. When someone serves you food before you eat, put your hands together in anjali, bow your head and say itadakimas. And it is not born appetite. Uh, my children come back and tell me born appetite. I say, no, 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 it's not born appetite. It's an expression of gratitude for receiving food. So that's one, the simplest itadakimas. There are some Japanese restaurants which are called itadakimas. So I think that that's probably the simplest and less than two seconds. Okay. But the important thing is not so much the word, but what is in your attitude that you wish to express gratitude, that you wish to say thank you? I think that's more important. Then within, of course, circle of friends who are uh, Theravadans, for example, when I take my students out, we do something good, and then I us we usually take them for a meal. Then we will do the sapitio, because the sapitio is what I teach them. All right, the sapitio, that four-line gata, is what we teach them in their puja. So that's when we will do the sapitio, and they're all quite familiar with the bawantu. So we'll do the sapitio and the bawantu. But you can just do the sapitio, because the, the point is to remember, okay, let's be grateful. Let's do what we can to bless the person who supplied us. When I'm out with my friends who are Mahayana Buddhists, I, I do the zibei sisa, which is just four lines. It's also very easy to remember. It's extremely profound. And I think that's something that most people can remember. All right, that Wu Guan Tang, that five is not easy to remember because different centers have different length of the Chinese praise which they use. Some are longer, some are shorter, some are modified. Ping Han one, as I told you, is very, very modified. But the Zi Pei Sisa is something which is quite standard, I would say. And um, I remember that, my friends remember that. So in that context, we will use the Zi Pei Sisa, that four line aspiration. So, Dr. Wu, I think that for the children in the center, um, what my wife and her fellow teachers do in our children's class is to have their little card, which they have all printed out and laminated, and the children will take that card. It's in English, so they actually recite it in English, all right? That, almost the same as the one that I showed you all earlier. So, for the children, that's something easy because it's in a language that they understand, for those of us who are outside and you want to dig in your food quick, itadakimas, within more conservative Tarawada circle, sapitio, if we are with a Mahayana group of friends, then sipe sisa. So I think that that's quite easy. Um, now with the handphone, it's very easy. Everybody carries a handphone, so you can just put it in your handphone. And within a very short while, you'll actually be able to remember and say it. But um, I think that whatever it is that you say, if you don't mean it and you just say because somebody has to say it, you know, I mean, uh, so and so say grace, you know, it's really just saying it because my mother said I must say it. That, that, that's not what we want. The point is you have this attitude and the simplest is itadakimas. And 
a longer one, probably the longest would be the Sapitio followed by the Bawantu Sabha Mangalam. All right, I, I think that is a very much an individual choice. Yeah, as long as you actually feel it, isn't it? Yeah. yeah that's right, that's right, yeah. So I think um, from now onwards, you know, we will choose, we will offer something easy and practical, uh, something that we can use it uh, wherever, in public or at home as well. Right, okay. Tonight, we have lots and lots of questions for Dr. Punya. Is it okay for us to extend a little bit? Yeah, I'm all right. All right, okay, good. Now, uh, let's take uh, another very uh, practical question, uh, something that is, uh, I think everybody will be able to relate it to, yeah, by um, Sister Marina Ong. Right, she, um, yeah, thank you. She said thank you for the inspiring talk. Um, and that it said that it's observed, you know, she observed the feeling of fullness to uh, be aware that, you know, when you have to stop eating, yeah? So if let's say you've already taken a plate, yeah, whether it's from the buffet or what, but you know, you, you have a plate in front of you, but before you can ever finish it, you already feel full. So will that be considered a waste of food if you stop? Okay. All right, first and foremost, any one of you in this group with children, and I'm sure lots of you in this group have children. I used to be the Majis Pabandara Johor Baru as far as my children mm -hmm. are concerned. You know, they will eat after that, I'm while they did, and you know, the father eats it, you know, we become Majis Pabandaran. So I always laugh under MPJB, you know, I say I'm saving you people. So this, of course, is the issue when we start by taking too much. Remember, uh, when I read Venerable Yifa's short little composition to you all, not to take too much at the beginning. Now, at Fokwang San, all centers, not just in Kaohsiung, but all centers, the meals are very ritualistic where you put the bowl, et cetera, et cetera, all have symbolic meanings. You put it in a certain position, that means you want a refill. Somebody will come and put more soup or more whatever. You put it in a certain way means I'm stopping. So they always begin by giving you not too much food because the principle is you have to finish whatever you're given. You mm -hmm. cannot leave food behind. It's the same when I was in the Zen temple that I showed you pictures of. You have to finish everything, so much so that even you have to leave a pickle behind, put hot water, rub so that that oil comes out, and then pour, pour, pour into the big one and drink it. The, the principle is no food wastage because these are all donated by people. So I think that if you have an issue now, like what Sister Marina put up, it's because we took too much right at the beginning and we have misjudged how much we need. So, I mean... Okay, now you have taken it, you really have no choice. Uh, unless you've got a, a father who is going to be the MPJB for you, you're going to have to finish that food. If not, your spouse is going to have a lot of pimples on the face according to my grandmother. So I, I think that this is an easy thing. Take whatever you can finish. And you know, if you're still hungry, take some more. All right. Again, this is a problem, a first world problem. My, my, my eldest daughter used to say, ah, oh, such first world problems, you know. So this is the first world problem. <laughs> this okay. is like, yeah. This normally happens when you go for buffet, like, isn't it? Yeah. And you know, you just you thought you can take, but you know, you 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 cannot finish at the end of the day. <laughs> All right. sure you bring a friend who can eat a lot. <laughs> be the majis for bandaran. Yeah, be the majis for bandaran. Right. Yeah. So okay, let's take another question because we have a few more to to uh, to to answer, and if any remaining one, we will answer it later, lah. Huh? Right, um, brother Tong Kok Wai has a question where he asks that in you know in Theravada tradition they actually restrict um the Sangha members uh, from eating after midday as part of the, the Vinaya rules. So was this a kind of training for the Sangha? You know, so far as food may not be widely available during ancient times. Hi, brother Tong Kok Wai. Brother Kok Wai is one of my dear friends in KL. Fantastic supporter of the Sasana. And uh, I can answer you based on what I remember as to how this rule came about. And again, I say, actually the Vinaya within the three lineages that are extant today is very much the same. I have in fact a book in my collection 
which compares the Vinaya line by line between the various traditions. Now, as far as I can recall, in the early years of the Sasana, there was no rule about restricted eating after midday. As a consequence, the monks went on arms round morning, and sometimes in the afternoon, etc., etc. And this gave rise to murmurings by the lay public against such a practice because, look, if you come in the morning, I offer fine. Now you come again in the afternoon and you expect me to offer again. First and foremost, people are not exactly very rich in those days. So if I remember correctly reading that part of the commentary of how this came about, this rule by the Buddha was first one to make it something such that the practice does not become a disturbance on the life of the lay people. And second, of course, it's a form of moderation. And hence, this rule of not allowing them to eat after the midday is very much seen in the Theravada tradition today where they still go on Armstrong. And in the Mahayana tradition, for example, they look at this as a minor rule and they do not follow it very strictly. First and foremost, they do not go on Armstrong to collect their daily food. So as far as I remember why this was the reason, one, do not disturb the people, do not become a um, sort of a, like an irritant, you know, you keep on coming so many times a day. And so this sort of standardized every day, everybody will go in the morning, that's it. You are no longer somebody going at different times, etc., etc. So I, I think if I remember correctly, Brother Kokwai, this was the reason why. Um, of course, the fact that you stated that food was not widely available probably was also a contributory factor. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Punya. Right. Um, since we are also, um, you know, um, talking about the monastic as well, so, um, there's another question. Um, posted from by um, TBCM regarding um, the monastic as well, um, about how do we handle Sangha members uh, who have malnutrition issue and we're still keen to be a vegetarian. This is especially true for for us who offer meals to you know offer dana to um, the Sangha members. So we need to also um, know about all these things. Yeah, and how do they actually seek a balanced diet? and at the same time, keep to their faith if they wish to be a vegetarian. Okay. Now I pick off my hat. I'm not <laughs> sharing the Dhamma. Now I'm putting it back my hat as a doctor. First, I must say, I find it hard to imagine a Sangha member in Malaysia with malnutrition problem. Okay. Most Sangha members in Malaysia are very well supported. We are a rich country. I think that Sangha members in any respectable center, if anything, will have a problem of overnutrition rather than malnutrition. So that's one. The second thing is with regards to vegetarianism. There are not one type of vegetarianism, but a few types of vegetarianism. You have first and foremost, the vegan. The vegan eats only vegetables full stop. And in my context in our local community and among my medical students, quite a number of whom are vegetarians, you'll be surprised. Quite a number of them are vegetarians. Now, the only ones I met in the JB community and among my students who are vegans, which means only vegetable, full stop, are Jains. There's a small community of Jains in Johor Bahru. They are strict vegans, which means they eat nothing else but vegetables. Now, if you eat nothing else but vegetables, then over time, you're going to develop vitamin B12 deficiency because B12 is only found in meat. We cannot make vitamin B12 and vegetables do not have adequate B12. So this will only happen about probably two to three years post somebody who is a strict vegan. Now, the other types of vegetarianism are what we call ovo-vegetarian. That means you eat eggs, 
eggs and vegetables. Now you know nowadays eggs are all farmed. They no longer have the embryo. You don't see that black dot in the egg yolk anymore today compared to let's say 40 years ago. They are all farmed. That poor hen has never seen a cockroach in her whole life. So there are some vegetarians who are ovo vegetarians. That means they eat eggs as well. If they eat eggs as well, then there's no issue with vitamin B12. And then you have lacto-vegetarians. They take milk and vegetables. Also no issue because our milk nowadays is fortified. And then you have ovo-lacto-vegetarians. That means they take eggs, they take milk and veggie. Also no issue. So as far as people who are vegetarians, be you sangha, be you lay, if you are a vegan, then yes, you need to take B12 supplements because if not over a long time of two to three years, you can become vitamin B12 deficient. So all you need to do is take B12 supplements. Now the other one is iron. We absorb him iron very well, which means iron from animal sources. We do not absorb iron from vegetables well. So again, if you eat a strict vegan diet over a long period of time, you may also develop iron deficiency, which especially if you're a woman with menstruation. So you will probably need some iron supplements as well. But the rest of the nutrients are usually not an issue. If you are an ovo-lacto vegetarian or ovo-vegetarian or a lacto-vegetarian, even iron is not an issue because they are fortified in our milk today. So I have actually no issue other than in strict vegans. And even the Chinese vegetarian sangha, they are not strict vegans. All right, they do take milk. Some take eggs, some do not take eggs. So I actually do not foresee them having any problems. Uh, for the female sangha, they may want to take some iron tablets because they may be a bit of an issue absorbing non-heme iron. All right. So I hope I answered your question, Brother Jason Cole. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. As long as if there's any deficiency, then you need to have some supplements in order to maintain the good health, to sustain your, your yeah. body, in fact. Yeah. Okay. And again, in today's time, there's no issue with supplements. Right, yeah, true. Yeah. Okay, so um, with the you know, time constraint now, yeah, uh, we shall end the Q&A session. Yeah, today is such a lively and engaging session that we have today. So many questions are coming in. Right, but you know, because of the time, we have no choice but to end the session. Yeah, so we thank you. Yeah, and you know, uh, we, we really... And great, very, we are very grateful to Dr. Punya for you know giving us such a great reminder for each and every one of us to always be grateful, not just for the food that we have on the plates, yeah, to be eaten, but also that we you know we can give our blessings and gratitude to all beings who have actually contributed to our meal, right? So we know that gratitude is very, very powerful. And that was in fact, you know, the first lesson that Buddha actually taught us after he gained his enlightenment, when he gazed at the Bodhi tree to show uh, his gratitude uh, for providing him shelter. So thank you very much, right? And we definitely will start saying itadikimas before we eat the next time. Yeah, and we also know why, you know, you fancy Japanese food, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so thank you all for the questions tonight and thank you Dr. Punia once again for sharing Dharma with us tonight. And let us all rejoice together. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Thank you.